Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. On my Patreon supported series of videos about Norse language, myth, and culture, I often try to answer questions as I can that come from my Patreon supporters. And one question that's been proposed uh, several times by my supporter, Jared Shurkamp, is about the Norse practice of fostering children. So I'm gonna talk a little bit in this video about what we read about that in the sagas, as well as give some thoughts about how that relates to broader Norse ideas about family. The vocabulary of fostering is very similar in Old Norse to that in English because, of course, these languages are closely related. A man in a relationship of being fostered or of being a fosterer is a fostri, and a woman who is either a fosterer or the fostered is a fostra. There's also relationships of those who are fostered by the same foster parents, your foster brothers, your fostbrother, plural fostbrother, and your foster sister, or foster sister and plural foster sister. Now, the term is actually uh, one of, of great affection, so that uh, you find that people related by blood will often call each other frandi. That's kind of the affectionate way of talking about somebody who's related to you uh, by blood. But somebody who's related to you by fosterage is fostri, and this is a very fond thing to call somebody, right? I don't know that I can think of a good parallel to it in 2020 English. Um, you know, dear friend or something like that. It has, a, it has a definite overtone of affection. And it's noticeable that loved pets and horses are often called fostri or fostra, depending on their sex, by their owners. Now, ultimately, these words for fostering come from the same root as English words like food and feed. Fostering is a relationship of feeding someone, right, or being fed, so that kind of makes sense. And in fact, uh, for a woman to fostra, the verb is for that woman to nurse a child. So you can even speak of a biological mother nursing fostra, her biological uh, child. Now, I mentioned these relationships can be very, very fond. They can actually be even fonder than the relationship between a biological parent and their biological children. One of the best examples of that is in Njal's saga, one of the most famous of the Icelandic sagas, and one that I've done a uh, several video series on, which if you're on YouTube in 2020, I'll link in the top right there. After Skarpeden, Njal's son, kills Throin, who is also Njal's son-in-law, he's married to one of, um, well, uh, he's the brother of a son-in-law. What does that make him? I don't, I don't know. These, these terms for relationships in English. But anyway, Skarpeth and Njolson is killed Throin. Njol's son-in-law, Ketil, who is Throin's brother, adopts Throin's son named Hoskulder. Njol is over at Ketil's house afterwards, and he happens to be talking to this young boy, uh, Hoskulder, and he asks him, a uh, strange thing to ask perhaps, but he says, Veits thu hvat fodr thinum vardat bana? Do you know how your father died? And the kid says, I know that Skarpedin, your son, killed him, and we too need in no way to talk about that, to remember that, when it has been settled, right? In medieval Norse society, you often pay a monetary price to the family of someone that someone in your family has killed to try to keep peace rather than have it just turn into bloody eye for an eye vengeance. And full compensation, full recompense has uh, has been forthcoming. And Yal says in response to that, Better er svarat en expurta, ok munthu verda goudra mother. Uh, you have answered better than I asked, and you will become a good man. And on the spot, he decides he's going to adopt this boy, the son of a man that his own son killed from uh, the son-in-law that had been uh, fostering him previously. Now, 
Noel becomes so much more fond of Hulskulder than of his own sons that he goes out of his way. It's a very convoluted story that would take longer than I'm going to take for this whole video to tell you all about the convoluted way that he gets uh, his foster son Hulskulder married. But he does. He, he arranges an excellent marriage for him. And when Hulskulder is killed by Njal's duped sons, another story again told in my Njal son saga video, uh, too long to get into here. Uh, Njal actually says to his biological sons, Mer thuti betra at havalotit tvo sonumina ok liv the Hoskulder. I would have thought it better to have lost two of my sons if Hoskulder had lived. So he becomes extremely affectionate toward this fostered son, even at the expense of his affection for his biological sons. No doubt something that can happen um, in a society where, you know, the, the demands of vengeance and of maintaining one's honor are so strong that your own biological sons might end up doing things you find pretty disagreeable uh, to establish their own reputations and maybe something that you fostered is a little bit closer to you in spirit as sometimes people from outside your family can be. Now in Lockstilla Saga we have a different Hoskulder who dies, he's actually related ultimately but that's a whole other thing. Watch my Lockstilla and Nail Saga videos if you want more about how all these people are connected. So this Hoskulder dies, and his legitimate son, Thorlaker, is mad that the bastard son, Olaver, is inheriting a lot of good stuff from the dad. Typically, bastard sons don't inherit as much as legitimate sons, but uh, Hoskulder really likes his illegitimate son, Olaver Peacock. And so Olaver Peacock, at the next thing, the next law council meeting, publicly offers to his, uh, his not very happy half-brother, Thorlaker, that he will foster his son, Kjartan Thorleikson. And this makes Thorleikr very happy. And, uh, Kjart and uh, Olaver says in making this offer, Er so kalaver e minimader er oldrum fostrar barn. That man is called always the lesser man who fosters another man's child. So the man who fosters another man's child is always called the lesser man. So this is interesting. It suggests that there is something that boosts your status about letting somebody else foster your kids. Maybe it has to do, I've always strongly suspected it has to do with a little bit of a notion that if someone else raises your kid, that kid might be tougher than you would raise that kid to be, right? Which might be a big concern with boys. You don't want to spoil them. You want them to grow up hard and strong. Somebody else might be a little bit harder on them, actually raise a better man than you could have at home with your perhaps more potentially indulgent attitude toward your own biological children. Um, let me pause here for a moment for a quick word from my sponsor and I'll come back with some more thoughts about fosterage and how it relates to Norse ideas of family. The relationship that they call Fost Brethralag, the arrangement between foster brothers, can actually be created directly by the ones that become brothers without a parent being invoked. For example, in Gisli Saga chapter 6, when Gisli and his friends, some soon to be ex friends, uh, dig a pit into the earth and make an arch over it for them all to mix their blood together inside of the pit, symbolically becoming brothers reborn together out of the womb of the same earth. There we read that they fellu ther allir okne ok sferia than ei that where skal annars hebna sem brother sins ok nevna old golden e vitni. They all fell onto their knees and they swore an oath that each would avenge the other as if his own brother and they named all the gods in witness. Now they create this foster relationship in order to um, assure that each one will avenge the others because they fear uh, prophecy that's been told that there'll actually um, be some, some dissension between them, some bloodshed. They want to try to forestall that by creating um, a more binding, peaceful agreement between them. Sometimes it seems to be the purpose of fostering. Sometimes it seems that what we're doing is just, is, is just sort of randomly mixing families. But in fact, that randomly mixing families probably serves much the same purpose. Right, in a world that's pretty violent, where people often take what they want from other people, bringing a neighbor into your network of people who are related to you by debt and obligation, whether it's you who owe the debt or obligation or them who owe it to you, 
makes it less likely that blood is going to be shed between you, right? Think about it. You are less likely to hurt someone that you actually know personally, let alone someone who's fed you at their own table or who you fed at your own table, than you are to hurt someone or maybe just something as simple as lie to someone that you don't know, right? People tend to treat complete strangers, people they don't have any obligations to, a little bit worse than people that obligations have been shared with, even if, and regardless of whether they're the debtor or the, uh, the, the one who is owed to. Now, in a world where this creates a relationship called Siv, which is the peace between family, we have to remember that Ragnarok, as foretold in Volus Bostanza 44, is actually when we will see Sivium Spilla, Siv, be destroyed. The relationship between family members, this peace between family members, be destroyed. So obligation and peace are tied together. Your immediate family is your skuldahion. Now, if you know some Old Norse, skuld is related to the English word should. This is the household of people that you have shoulds to, right? That you are shoulded to, that you are obligated to in some way. A relationship of blood alone is called friend semi, right? Relationness. But there's a stronger thing called skuld semi. You're not just related, but you have obligations between you. And of course, you can have skuld semi with people you have no blood relationship with, whatever. So your network is your skuld man, your, your people or men, but the word is sort of gender non-determinative in Old Norse. So your people who you have obligations shared with. You can be skulder at fransemi, obligated by blood relationship, but there's a lot of other ways to be skulder. Keep in mind, these are almost exactly the same as words for things like debt. Debt is skilda. So they have a, you know, I, I think this kind of gets, it's mixed up for some people today because people get all of these kind of weird uh, clannish ideas about the Vikings. They have a kind of vague Lamarckus notion of heredity, but the family is an assemblage of debts more than of genes, right? They don't know what genes are. The children you feed owe you food in your old age. They owe you vengeance for wrongs done to you. And you owe the family of the woman or sequential women you publicly married that you will treat your kids with her best, which isn't about some pre-scientific idea of genes. It's about the investment that family made in her as a generator of, well, income in the form of farm laborers and supporters in old age and avengers in the form of children. If you're wealthy enough, maybe getting somebody else to raise those kids might make them tougher and it saves you a little trouble. If you're the fosterer, it creates a family, i.e. debt relationship, to someone likely to grow up to wield considerable resources and influence and help you with them. They are you know, very transactional in their family and, and other relationships, but so is everybody, right? To call it transactional is not to call it mercenary exactly. You trust that the people that you feed are going to be the people who feed you or other people you love as you all get older. And that might be your biological children. People certainly usually hope that their biological children will come back and kind of, you know, pay back or pay forward what, what was given to them in their youth. But there's no, there, there's nothing more distant, if you will, about the foster child. They're equally fed. They may well be equally or even more beloved as Niall's relationship with his foster son, Holskuller, suggests to us. And ultimately it makes a wide, deep network of skilled men that reduce the number of people you have to worry about cutting your throat, except in the sagas where these relationships are always played up for the possibilities of betrayal in them, and makes it more possible that those you have fed will feed you, and in a world where people get killed all the time, you kind of want to spread out those possible obligations so that hopefully somebody will still be alive to help you if you survive to be uh, old and in conflict with some neighbor or something. So keep in mind, Fostering has to do with creating these new debts, creating these new relationships, creating new family, new skilled men. And that is such a huge part of the Norse consciousness. Well, from beautiful golden western Colorado, some of the only Colorado that's left west of the Front Range, let me wish you all the very best. You and your skilled men. <laughs>